Thank you, Dan, for that song leading tonight. Glorious is thy name. I didn't know that one, did you? But he led it with such confidence, he almost had me convinced that I did. <laughs> and I wondered as I sat down, how many of you did not recognize the picture of the family that was up on the screen? Come on, come on, I'm expecting this. All right, fathers knows best, right? Because there was a day in which many families in our culture believed that the father was the leader of the home and that he had wisdom and responsibility and he was to direct his household in the way that was resolved, uh, was right, and he could resolve conflicts and issues and he could help his children work things out. Does that sound like a pretty good idea? Our world has changed so much so steeply and so swiftly that we can hardly keep up with it, right? Did you notice that Toys R Us has closed all 800 of its U.S. stores? Do you know the reason why that giant in the toy industry has folded up? You're going to say it's the online competition, right? And it's other major outlets. Do you know the other reason? It's the sagging birth rate in our country. The CEO said that they cannot maintain their existence and be profitable unless, well, families have children. And in our land, the birth rate is down to about 1.71 for each family. It needs to be 2.11 for any culture to survive. So what's happening in European countries like France and Germany and Spain is that Muslims are immigrating and having lots and lots and lots of children and those that live there previously are waiting later to get married or not marrying and having fewer, fewer, fewer children. And so ultimately, some Muslims have said that without a shot being fired or a bomb being detonated, they will take over the culture. And I read one source said that in 50 years, there'll be so no, no such thing as Germany. It's been said that the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. Have you ever heard that? I'm going to say tonight it's the hand that rocks the most cradles that rules the world. Don't you love it that we keep hearing about new babies? Our families are growing. We're bringing children into the world, and we're going to raise them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. They're going to be great servants of God. So get married, have children, and then have more children. In our own society, we've seen a decline, especially with millennials. Delaying marriage, not marrying, or not having children. And so percentage-wise, compared to just a few years ago, there's a drastic gap. So that I noted by a certain year, there will be more senior citizens. By 2035, senior citizens will outnumber children for the first time in U.S. history. In 1965, those between ages 21 and 36 years old, 80% were married. Today, just 37% in that same age range. Our culture is changing. And there are things we need to address and face from this pulpit that will not be made public in many other places in our society. As our schools change, our government, as all of these politically correct movements come along. It will be the church, it will be the Christian home, and it will be Bible-based media that will help to get the word out about the way that things really are. Tonight, we're going to talk about gender and what the Bible teaches that in the beginning, God made male and female. And he took one of each and he joined them together and they became one flesh. And he told them what? Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and have dominion over all the rest of creation. In our Wednesday night parenting class, one of our scholars noted that the latest thing is that women are like spaghetti and men are like waffles. Have you heard this? That men tend to compartmentalize, have everything in a separate box. Is that the way we are? And women, kind of everything is relational. Everything goes together, and one part affects the rest. God made us different, biologically, psychologically, and emotionally. Brains, temperament, pr 
problem-solving strengths, men and women are not interchangeable. And you can even alter the physical dynamics to a certain extent. And what you have on the inside is still what God made from the very beginning. We are complementary, completing each other, not competing with each other. No one can do what the other can do, and neither can do what both together can do. In our men's breakfast yesterday, Keith Elmore talked with us about Ecclesiastes 4. Two are better than one. They have a reward for their labor. If one falls down, the other will lift up his brother. Woe to him that's alone when he falls, and a cord of three strands is not easily broken. That's true in all relationships, but it certainly fits the home. If you turn in your Bible with me to Genesis chapter 1, you know the passage as well as I, but it's so important for us to recommit ourselves to the worldview that says, in the beginning, God. And if we change that fourth word to anything else, whatever follows will be way off track and far different. So the atheist and secular movement around us would take out God and therefore everything's up for grabs. Gender, marriage, morality or lack of it. Verse 26, God said then, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. I want you to notice God made man, male and female. Does everybody see that in your Bible? To call humanity man some today shun. Oh, that sounds so discriminatory. And so words like mankind, even a college in our nation now tells its students they can't use the word woman anymore. I read that the word female is off the list and also the word lady. I'm not sure how to address anybody anymore. What was ironic about it was it was an all-female school where you have to be female in order to enroll, but then you're told that the word woman is a no-no. I want us to see that the image of God is something that we bear as human beings, that we are distinct in the gender that God has given us, but we equally, at the very same level and degree, reflect the one who made us. Then in chapter 2, starting at verse 18, when God saw it wasn't good for the man to be alone, do you realize one of the first things the Bible reveals about man is his inadequacy? Can I hear that, men? Our insufficiency, our incompleteness. So if somebody reads the Bible and says, oh, it's all male-dominated, it's all patriarchal, it's all about men, 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 subjugating all these women, all they need to do is read Genesis 1, male and female, image of God. God said to them, subdue the earth and then chapter 2 man's not going to make it unless he has a helper but you and I know God had created Adam physically to where he needed a counterpart to become one and to fill the earth and God had made Adam psychologically so that he needed the balance that Eve would give him and God had made man emotionally so that he was missing something and we men admit it and so God caused a deep sleep to come over the man. He took one of his ribs and formed the woman, presented Eve. And Adam said, it's a Hebrew word that we can't quite capture, but the best word is wow. <laughs> we sometimes smile and say that first God passed all these animals by him. And Adam, no, no, definitely not, you know. And then Eve, Wow. He was overcome with joy, and she's called woman because she's taken from man. And even, even in the original language, the two words are 
Similar, the word for man is ish, I-S-H, and the female form is isha. We'll call her isha because she came from ish. You know what the word Adam means? Ground. The Hebrew word Adama. God said, let's call him Adam because he was taken from the Adama. And so the woman, complementary, as a counterpart, as a helper, suitable to fit the needs of the man. From the very beginning, that is not demeaning. That is complementary. That is an honor to a man that a woman would feel what's lacking. And to a woman, that she would have the privilege to help the man get through this life so they could become all that they could be together. And then the Bible talks about the intimate marriage relationship at the end of chapter 2, that the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed, and that this was before sin or temptation entered the picture. So we know this is God's holy and perfect and pure design and plan. Chapter 3, there's the fall, and Eve listens to the serpent. She takes the fruit against God's direction, and she gives some to her husband who's with her, and sometimes that's discussed. Verse 6, that why didn't he intervene? Why didn't he lead? Why didn't he do what he ought to do? But both of them faced consequences. The man, because he didn't listen to God, but to the woman instead, would toil sweat and strain in the field and the woman in giving birth there would be pain and her desire would be connected with her husband toward her husband yet sometimes in opposition to her husband and he would have the leadership over her it's rooted in creation that's why it's not a setting just for one season or another or another Father Knows Best and other sitcoms grew out of a climate in which that was understood. It was accepted that this wasn't about just the Old Testament period. It hadn't begun yet with Moses or just about the New Testament. This is God's uh, pre-covenant design. It's an arrangement he made with all humanity. Then in marriage, Ephesians chapter 5, have a book titled Love and Respect, which notes based on Ephesians 5.33 that the number one thing a wife needs from her husband is love and that a husband needs from his wife is respect. And that verse says that the husband is to love his wife. Christ loves the church. And the wife is to respect her husband. That's what he needs. And so the responsibility of headship the accountability that a man has to Almighty God, not only for himself but for his wife and children, is sobering. It is serious. It ought to be the primary uh, factor in every one of our lives as men of God. And the woman's role, submit to your husbands as the church does to Christ. And this way, we show the world a microcosm. We show... The, the glory of Christ and why we submit to Him and His love and sacrifice and kindness. And we show what He has done to purchase us and remove our wrinkles as His bride, make us without blemish or spot or any such thing. So the relationship of marriage is complementary with the husband as the head and the wife in submission. This is God's design. It's not demeaning. It's not disrespectful. It doesn't undervalue either of them, but helps them find their role and actually places this tremendous task on the husband's shoulders. And much of which we face today in the breakup of the home is a result of men not stepping up, not teaching, not leading, not modeling, not loving our wives as Christ loved the church. What woman wouldn't want to be married to a man that's like Jesus Christ? Would you answer that? That's unselfish and yielded, tender and affectionate, willing to listen and to support and make his wife beautiful. And then 1 Timothy 2, if you'll turn there in your Bible, it's appropriate. We're in the process of seeking male leaders 
Because the Bible tells us in chapter 3 that the overseer, also called the elder or shepherd, pastor, must be a man, must be a married man, the husband of one wife. Prior to that, in chapter 2, going back to creation, we read about the specific roles of men and women, men in prayer, Women, verse 9, modestly, discreetly. Verse 8, the men. I should have gone back to verse 8. The men praying. The women, modest and discreet. Good works. Verse 11, quietly receive instruction with entire submissiveness. I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet. Why is that? Well, there are two reasons he gives. First has to do with creation, and the other has to do with the fall. He goes all the way back to Genesis. God made Adam. Then God made Eve. Eve was deceived when she took of the fruit. And so God has arranged a relationship that is rooted in creation of the fall, that is reflected in marriage, and that is reaffirmed in the church. I want us to think about the fact that people have different roles but equal value. We accept this every day. You go into the office, the boss and the employee are equally valuable in the sight of God, but there's a hierarchy, there's a distinction. In an airplane, there's the pilot and the co-pilot and the attendants and the passengers. In a school, there's a principal, teachers, students, they're all precious in the sight of God. But the position that they have been given is unique. And they cannot be seen as the same in their activities and their skills and their expectations. In farming, Paul said, I planted, Apollos watered. Each a different role. God made it grow. So you don't argue about who puts out the seed and who puts out the water. You say, to God be the glory. What do we need to do to help this thing be what God wants it to be? Construction project, the foreman, the workers, the architect. In politics, the president, the vice president, the cabinet members. In sports, the coach, the quarterback, the linesman, the referees, spectators yelling in the stands, right? In traffic, there's the police, there's the pedestrian, there's the driver, there's the rider. And so it's something that we see everywhere we look in life. No person can do everything that can be done in a specific area. Whatever the role, it's limited. If you're in this spot, you don't get to do what everybody else gets to do. Each role is needed, and without it, something is going to be unattended to. Each person's role is dependent on the others. No one is autonomous, able to make it without any help from others. And every person's role is subject. You say, now wait a minute, Corey. Doesn't the person at the top, isn't he or she, aren't, isn't that person free to do whatever they want to do? No, they're accountable to the shareholders. Politicians accountable to the voters. And so the scripture notes, if you look at 1 Corinthians 11, that the head of man is Christ. Man is not some sort of independent, do what he feels like or chooses. He's under the headship of Christ. The head of the woman is the man. And the head of Christ is God. And then it's again, chapter 15, 25 to 28, that Jesus Christ is subject to the Father. You see, what the Father did, and what the Son did, and what the Spirit did, and what each one does, equally important. This is God, one God in three personalities. But they are not transposable. You cannot swap them. Each has a specific function in our salvation. Notice in Jesus' earthly ministry how he surrendered himself. He said in John 4, my meat, my food, is to do the will of him that sent me. 
We noted this morning in Gethsemane, not my will, but yours be done. Jesus, in a sense, even made himself subject to us. Because according to Philippians 2, he emptied himself in order to deliver us from sin. There's a movement in our age to determine that gender is not something inborn or God-given. It's what somehow we have created. And that other than biological differences, men and women are interchangeable and should be regarded as able to function in every role in exactly the same way. The fact is that scripture and science and society and history and nature have all agreed that is not the case. And for centuries, in every nation across the world, not just our time, this is not an American thing, but it's been recognized because of the way we are that men and women are different and complementary and that physical differences go beyond certain external things. For example, as a rule, the male brain is about 10% heavier than a female brain. And that reflects the general difference in body size. That doesn't mean men are smarter, but we have big headed. <laughs> Women's brains, significantly stronger patterns of interconnectivity across brain re regions, across the hemispheres. This is the spaghetti. Men, greater connectivity within our waffle zones, local brain regions. Male skin, microscopically thicker. Do you know any thick-skinned men? Thick, thicker skin. Well, thinner skin is damaged more easily by sunlight, physical injury, and mechanical stress. And uh, there are reasons why I'm, I could be in trouble. A woman's face wrinkles earlier than a man's. I did not write this. <laughs> I only report. I don't choose the facts. Sense of smell, stronger in a woman, has to do with hormones. Men tend to have heavier bones, bulkier muscles, broader shoulders, larger hearts and lungs, and so physically stronger. The areas of the brain that involve language and fine motor skills mature earlier in who? Boys or girls? Girls. We guys admit it. The parts of the brain involved in targeting <laughs> and spatial memory mature earlier in boys. During adolescence in girls, let's say a 17-year-old, she's able to explain why she's feeling sad in great detail and without much difficulty. Boys, they don't know why in the world they're feeling sad. Somehow that emotion is stuck in the amygdala. You may not know you had an amygdala, but you do, and that's where it's stuck. Studies in the U.S. and around the world universally find that boys are more likely to engage in physically risky activities. True? Yes. All right. Men have more uh, testosterone, larger heart and lungs, greater oxygen uptake, higher concentration of hemoglobin. Men have more fast twitch muscles than women. What does that mean? And women and uh, men have dissimilar hip structures. They differ in how their bodies move. So athletics, that's affected. There are literally, one writer says, hundreds more differences between men and women. Have you ever heard of John Stossel? He used to be on ABC 2020. He's aired specials about such differences. And so feminist icon Gloria Steinem told Stossel, differences between men and women shouldn't even be studied. Such research should be stopped. And then feminist lawyer Gloria Allred argued, Stossel shouldn't even be recording and airing a program about male-female distinctions. She said, we take attacks from the media on our skills and our abilities and our talents and our dreams very seriously. This is not just entertainment. This is harmful and damaging to our daughters' lives and to our mothers' lives, and I'm very angry about it. So the feminist movement and the atheist movement the gender confusion movement is trying to set up, and I don't know why, continual conflict, controversy, 
debate, argument, misery, unhappiness. Why is it? When a man loves his wife like Jesus loves the church, when a woman respects her husband for the role that God's given him and the part that she can play, it's a beautiful thing. The families here are a testimony to that fact. I mentioned about marriage because once society decides that a man can marry a man, what if one of those two men decides, you know, I think maybe I'm not a man after all? Maybe I should have some change made. Let's see, how do I feel? What do I want? What do I like? So let me choose from the options of gender which one I prefer and then have whatever change is made that I can to bring that about. So if a man can marry another man, why can't he marry a horse or a tree? Or himself. If I can identify myself as a woman, can't, why can't I identify myself as a member of British royalty and ask everyone to treat me accordingly? So, of course, you can't get by with that. Why? Because it's biology. Exactly right. And so the changes that are made are extremely damaging. And studies have been begun to show that the outcome is terrible and dangerous. There's been a new $5.7 million study commissioned by the National Institutes of Health. They've already decided what it's going to conclude. They want to support, find an argument to substantiate chemically and surgically altering the bodies of children. If you don't subscribe to the breakpoint emails, you might look it up sometime. There's much to learn about culture and what worldview has to do with the way people address morality in changing times. Do you remember the good old days when you'd fill out a form and there were two choices, male or female? How many of us can remember that? The University of California system, 233,000 students at 10 campuses. Now you have six options for your gender. Male, female, Trans male slash trans man, trans female slash trans woman, gender queer slash gender nonconforming. Number six, different identity. You know what that is? None of the above. That's what we've come to. That's what's being taught in our schools. I wanted to tell you something about the results of these studies and these procedures that are done. And the fact that they lead to so much regret and so much pain down the uh, road. This so-called treatment involves high doses of puberty-suppressing drugs, flooding the system with testosterone or estrogen. The person will become infertile for life, can develop cancer, infections, gallbladder diseases, spikes in blood pressure. Abundant data show the results, the psychological damage. 41% commit suicide or attempt it. 90% have a significant form of psychopathology. And half have depressive symptoms. If a child would just be allowed to grow into adolescence, Robbins and Tuttle's research says that 80 to 90% of those children who struggle with gender when they were younger will accept their biological gender by late adolescence. In other words, they'll grow out of it. It's during this impressionable time that liberals in our world are coming and say, you know, maybe you're this, maybe, maybe that. Have you considered such and such? You ought to explore this and think about it. Free speech is a thing of the past on many of our university campuses. Title X provides federal funding now to those schools that do not, quote, discriminate against, down goes the list, so that a private school 
that will not go with the new flow may have to do without those funds for student loans and Pell Grants or else compromise. Recently, Google engineer James Damore, did you hear about him? He was fired by Google. He sent a memo out that had the nerve to suggest that men and women were different. The Google CEO called it offensive and not okay and said that the memo advanced harmful gender stereotypes. You can read that memo. It's actually very thoughtful and very cautious in the language. It's not demeaning. It's not disrespectful. It simply notes, not even from a specifically Christian point of view, that there are two genders and they're not identical physically, biologically, emotionally, psychologically. There's a crisis in our culture. The diversity dilemma is this. On the one hand, such folks as the CEO of Google are saying let's acknowledge and promote diversity. They seek to hire people from different demographics and backgrounds and yes, genders. And then you know what they say? Let's fire and silence the people that discuss it. Let's promote it but let's don't admit it. What are Christians to do? Keep being men. Yes? The men's retreat. Steve Miner is going to challenge us men to be male, to be masculine, to be what God holds us responsible to be. Ladies, let's be women. God's girls. Let's grow up to reflect the beauty and the holiness of Jesus Christ in all the roles that God gives us in the church and in the family and in the world. Let's keep getting married. Let's keep having babies. And let's keep growing a great army of servants of God. Let's go back to the basics. When Jesus said, in the beginning... God created them male and female. A man, one man, shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his one female wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Let's affirm it, let's honor it, and let's celebrate it. And let's praise God for what he has made and for what he has given us. Gender surrender, no. We're not going to surrender. We will preach, we will teach, we will model, and we will live out what the Bible says that in the beginning, God. And because of that, we know who we are and the role we play in various aspects of life. We've already noted that Jesus, though he is our king and our master and our Lord, he emptied himself and became a man and went to the cross so that he might give us what we would not otherwise ever attain. And in that sense, he lowered himself, made himself subject, if you will, to our concerns and our burdens. And that's why when a person says yes to Jesus, turns from sin, is clothed with Christ in baptism, buried and raised again. That person is subjecting himself or herself to the one who gave it all to save us from sin. If you'd respond with that concern, if you have any questions, anything you'd like to know more about the Bible or about the church that meets here, if we can assist you in any way, won't you come? Let's stand and sing. <coughs>